Welcome to the Title IX at 50 Educate and Advocate webcast. I am Damon Markowitz and I am speaking today with Kathy Mangano. This is the first of eight webcasts dropped on the 9th of every month from September through April as part of Kathy's Distinguished Springfield Professor of Humanics project. During our time today, we will ask Kathy questions that help us educate on this important civil rights law. In wrap up, we will focus on ways that we all can help advocate to strengthen and secure Title IX. Let me start by sharing Kathy's background information. Kathy has more than 30 years of teaching, coaching, and administrative experience at Springfield College. Kathy was a Springfield College head softball coach for 20 years with five appearances in the NCAA tournament and leading the program to 481 wins. A three-time New Mac Coach of the Year, Kathy was named the New England Regional Softball Coach of the Year in 2000. Prior to her time as a faculty member and head coach at Springfield College, Kathy was a four-year starter at first base for the Springfield College softball program. She earned both her undergraduate degree in 1986 and graduate degree in 1988 from Springfield College. In addition, she earned a doctorate of education from UMass Amherst and is a 2016 Springfield College Athletic Hall of Fame inductee. During her time at Springfield College, Kathy has been a strong advocate for Title IX, helping lead changes to the softball program facilities so they were in compliance with Title IX regulations. The 2022-23 Distinguished Springfield Professor of Humanics, Kathy is devoting her time in this honorable role to further educate and advocate for Title IX. Kathy, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Damon. The first question we have, and it's an obvious question, but walk us through what is Title IX. Sure. Title IX is a federal civil rights law that profoundly changed education in the United States by prohibiting sex discrimination in schools, in all schools. It helped provide access and equality to education and activities, including athletics, and it specifically helped girls and, and women who at the time were male dominated. Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972 states that, and I quote, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any educational program or activity receiving federal financial assistance, unquote. So under Title IX, sex discrimination can include such thing as denying admissions into educational and training programs. It includes providing unequal educational uh, resources to students of one sex compared to another. Mm -hmm. And it, it can include uh, engaging in gender discrimination or sexual harassment, to name a few. Why did you select Title IX? Great question. You know, um, in June, on June 23rd of this year, we celebrated a milestone, and that was the 50th anniversary of Title IX. And many people do not know what Title IX is. And what we're also facing is, you know, the regulations for Title IX are constantly changing. Thus, the title of my project, um, Title IX at 50, Educate and Advocate. I think it's important to understand how far we have come and how far we still need to go to secure and strengthen this very important civil rights law. So what's going to happen is my project will be intertwined with the Title IX Steering Committee and the Office of Non-Discrimination Initiatives here at the college. There are an array of uh, program events scheduled throughout the year, including the one today, for which we are celebrating the history of women's uh, basketball. Mm -hmm. Walk us through what you want to accomplish through this uh, year-long project. Well, in, 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 to me personally, an important element of the humanics philosophy is action. And this is humanics in action. By educating and advocating to ensure equal opportunity and access to education for all. So on August 9th, and there's a theme here, we're focusing on the number nine, 
Um, on, on August 9th, I sent out an email to the campus community highlighting um, the project. And as we're continuing to talk about, the, there's an educational component and there's an advocate pro component. On the uh, education side of the house, uh, we're doing the webcast. As you mentioned, there will be eight, and this is the first of, of eight, and I have an array of guests that will come and speak and educate us and, ad, and promote av advocacy for Title IX. So be on the lookout for uh, the ninth of every month, a webcast will be dropped. We also have social media pages, uh, Instagram and Facebook, uh, SC at Title IX at 50, so that will be constantly populated. Uh, along with uh, the college website, we have targeted a specific page, website page, that um, is exclusively involves all the content that will be covered for the year and the celebrating the, the 50th anniversary. Other things that are gonna happen on the educational side of the house, uh, they're gonna be articles and stor stories in the student newspaper. Check out page nine on, uh, in every edition. We will also have reading trails and there are two uh, events taking place during homecom homecoming weekend which is September 30th and October 1st, and that's the Trailblazer event and the Power of 37 Words event. So those are some, uh, some events. Again, there's gonna be a lot more. Uh, another component of the education side of the house is I'm inviting faculty to incorporate Title IX content in their course courses. Um, Personally, I think Title IX impacts all of us, so what a great way to, to educate our students by embedding it into course content. On the, uh, well, in, in the email that I sent out on the 9th, there was also a link to a uh, spreadsheet that includes uh, tons of Title IX resource materials, everything from films to videos to websites, articles that can help uh, be a resource to faculty and others um, on the side of education. So that website will be continuously populated and uh, so that's the education side of the house. On the advocacy side of the house, in, uh, on the, in the email, there was a link to a Title IX advocacy project registration form and I am encouraging anyone to complete an advocacy project. And they can do this project solo, uh, as part of a team, an organization, a class. And the advocacy, there's a registration form, it's a short form to complete, basically explaining what they're gonna do to advocate for Title IX. It can be a, a very small project or they can take it to the extremes. One of the things regarding the advocacy project that I'm hoping is that at the end of the project, that people will complete a uh, reflection component. And that reflection component is two part. One, reflect on what they learned about Title IX, and two, relate and share with us how it relates to humanics. So all those that are, participate in an advocacy project, we'll get a t-shirt. Um, the deadline for registration is January 15th of 2023. And the reason for the deadline is because on February 9th, there's the nine again, um, I'm hosting a Title IX Advocacy in Action um, event. And that's going to be on the 9th at 7 p.m. in the Dodge Room. And during that, uh, during the evening, all the advocacy projects will be displayed. Now there's no formal presentation, just I want all these projects to be displayed and to uh, share what, what the people on campus have done to help um, advocate. The other, uh, the last part regarding the advocacy component is that we, uh, eligible students, and again I need to emphasize the eligible students um, those that have completed the 300 uh, wellness and physical literacy course can earn wellness passport stamps if they participate in uh, the registration. So I hope campus community and, and I would appreciate 
campus community getting involved in educating and advocating uh, through, this, through these projects. Walk us through, Kathy, how Title IX has impacted you in your life. And I've thought a lot about this, and when I think about it, I was eight years old when Title IX passed, and to be honest, with you, I, I didn't know much about it. And as I got older, I began to learn more about it and started appreciating all the everything that the Trailblazers did to help fight for the inequalities. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it was absolutely amazing. So. As I got older, um, I, I came from a very supportive family that encouraged us all to participate in, in sports. And I uh, played a lot of sports with my siblings. And um, one sport I played was baseball. And I played baseball with all the boys. And, and um, that was fine and until a, um, a camp counselor, a female camp counselor, said to me, you know, maybe it's time for you to just play softball. And, you know, I was, I was disappointed because I loved baseball and I enjoyed softball as well. Um, but I guess she was right because, you know, softball became such a big part of my career. Mm -hmm. But um, I did enjoy baseball and was disappointed on that side of the house. In addition, in, in high school, I was a three-sport athlete. And when I think about what about Title IX as a, as a high school athlete, a couple things come to mind. One was uh, the facilities. Um, the softball field was subpar to the baseball field. And the softball program and the girls' soccer team played on town fields where Baseball and the boys' ba uh, soccer team played on the high school field. So we always had a commute and traveled for practices and games to the town fields. So that's what I remember for those two sports. Um, in basketball, what I recall um, if, in, based on inequities was, it, you know, our game time was always 5 o'clock, but the boys played at 7, and that was prime time. So they always se seemed to have a lot more um, fans um, because it was seven o'clock prime time. Mm. When, it, when it comes to being a uh, student athlete here at Springfield, um, hands down the, 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 the part of t what I felt was inequitable, um, again, had to do with the fields. The um, Potter Field, uh, which was in, uh, the, pot the field was, dedicated Dr. Potter in 85, and that was my junior year. And the field was played in the same location it is now. Um, I am thrilled is what both the baseball and field, softball fields look like today. But back then, uh, there was a big difference between um, Potter Field and the Barry Allen Field. So those are the things that I, that I recall. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Do, do you have a specific story that you could share on how Title IX has impacted uh, you in your career and your, your life? Yes, um, I, I haven't. I often I haven't shared this very often, um, but it, it was extremely impactful for me. And it was my, during my time as the head softball coach. Um, I'm going to say I informally filed a complaint uh, with Springfield College. Um, I was hired in '89 on a tenure track position as a teacher coach. And every year we were requested um, to submit our capital request um, to our athletic director. And every year my list included an electronic scoreboard, dugouts, press box, warning tracks, batting cages, all that fun stuff. I, every year I put that on the list. And, um, Slowly but sure, we, you know, um, I think it was a couple of years later, we were fortunate to get the electric scoreboard. Now, I want you to, uh, I'm sure there are photos out there, but there are because some of the team photos were, we had um, a, a metal scoreboard and it was like the old Fenway where we would go up every inning and someone would hang up the signs where the baseball field had a nice electronic field. So we did get the electric scoreboard uh, scoreboard and 
they did resurface the field, which uh, was very much needed. But there were still significant um, inequities in the field. So um, in 19, 1994, I wrote a letter to Dr. Ed Billick, who was the athletic director at the time, regarding my uh, equity concerns between the baseball and softball field. And it had to do with equality. And um, I've kept all this literature, and I just want to read and share a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of funny reading these letters and how I wrote back in, in 94. But on November 2nd, 1994, um, again, I'll read parts of it. I wrote, recently the softball field has been graciously updated with an electronic scoreboard and resurfaced infield. But more work needs to be done to, be, to meet the equitable facilities of our counterpart sport, baseball. At that time, I thought they were comparable, but baseball and softball are not comparable sports. If you walk over to the two fields, you can plainly see the major discrepancies between the Harry Allen and the Diane Potter fields. To name a few of those areas, the baseball field is equipped with brick dugouts, a stone gravel warning track, press box behind the backstop, metal bleaches, a fenced-in hitting pitching cage, and a maintenance crew that works endlessly on the field. Softball has been a varsity sport on this campus for 31 years. Within this time span, little has been done in renovating Potter Field. It is an embarrassment to Springfield College and the softball program to bring, to bring prospective student athletes and their families to the facility. I feel I am constantly apologizing for the appearance and the patchwork, and, and patchwork is not the answer. I go on and I said, let me also stress that this letter is by no means devaluing the fine baseball program, our fine baseball program. These gender equity concerns have been an issue for many years and I know there is no one that fights for and stresses equality more than him. Dr. Billick definitely supported, I think there was um, financial, um, the, it was always uh, budget concerns, couldn't find the money. So um, now I'm going to move over to, to 96. 1996 was a very eventful year. Um, I believe it's the year that Springfield moved from Division II to Division III. It's also the year that uh, Dr. Craig Poison and Dr. Kathy Schweitzer joined the athletic uh, staff, the, the athletic department staff. It's also the year I earned tenure and that plays a significant role in, in what I'm gonna to share. Um, and 1996 was also the year that we were denied uh, the ability to host the NCAA regional tournament. So you can imagine I was a little upset um, and I wrote another letter. And again, I wanna share some parts of that. This letter is dated April 16th, 1996. And again, it is um, directed to Dr. Billick. Go on, I said, recently I received a memo from the NCAA preparing us for possible tournament play. One section of the me memo is asking to notify them if we are interested in serving as host for a regional competition. After much debate, I question whether Potterfield is of quality to host a tournament. Some of my concerns are the following, and I listed all the things that we did not have, dugouts, Fence needed repair, bleaches were deteriorating, we had no press box, the sound system is portable and difficult to hear, we had no flagpole or flag, and the out, outfield um, was very uneven. I wrote, I am well aware that the dugouts are a high priority of yours and that the deferred maintenance list is extremely long. My point in this memo is to make you aware of my concerns and to see what we can can be done to alleviate, alleviate some of these inequities regarding facilities. If the opportunity does arise, arise, yes, I would like to host a regional tournament with the understanding that some of my concerns would, could be addressed. I am sure you would agree that hosting a regional softball event would benefit Springfield College. So at that point, um, that was in, a, in April. And then um, we got the denied letter that we were unable to, to host. And um, then my next letter came in August of that year. Um, and this 
letter went to the director of uh, facilities at the time. And it was August 26th of 1996. Now, I just want to just recap. In February of 96 is when I earned tenure. So the, I'll get to that point. But my letter, and again, I'll read just a portion of it to, to uh, the director of facilities. When examining the facility comparisons, two programs stand out the most, baseball and softball. Enclosed is a list of the most notable differences. These inequities have been an issue for many years. And although the staff and administration are well aware of them, very little has been done to rectify the problems. Inequities involving accommodations, and this is the part of Title IX, were most notable when the Springfield College softball program was denied the possibility of hosting the 1996 Northeast Regional Tournament. Enclosed is a letter of all the facility concerns given to me by the tournament site director. I only wish that you and or the administration could have explained to my players why we had to travel to Ithaca College during exam week instead of hosting the tournament on campus. I go on to say, um, also in closing this letter, are the copies of segments of rules and regulations taken from playing fair. fair. And this was um, from the Women's Sports Foundation and this document was very resourceful for me. Uh, I also provided information um, in the OCR, the Office of Civil Rights, Title IX Investigators Manual. And it was an extremely thick book manual um, that I provided as a resource. After viewing these materials, it will become evident to you that the facility accommodations have become a gender issue. According to my findings, the conditions of the Springfield College men's and women's athletic facilities are not comparable. Springfield College is off one excellent condition and one good condition facility in favor of the men's programs. So what's in this document is a list of all our men's and women's facilities, programs, and they're rated on excellent, good, poor, and that's there was the inequity. These disparities are obvious when comparing the baseball and softball field. Although what has been done in the past cannot be changed, what is happening in the present can. These issues can no longer be overlooked, and the lack of funds is not an acceptable excuse, according to the OCR. I write, I am requesting immediate action to be taken to rectify these longstanding inequities by which my program and student athletes seem to be affected the most. I go on to um, say, I am also requesting to establish a timeline detailing when each and every inequity would be addressed. Dr. Billick has been informed of my concerns and supports my request. To get the process moving, I would like to schedule a meeting this week with you and Dr. Billick, who not only dis to whom I not only discuss my concerns, but to also accompany uh, you and him and I mm -hmm. on a tour of Potterfield so the two of you can see firsthand what I'm talking about. So what came of this meeting is um, we used to have, and I, I don't know if there's, it's still on campus, is a, a projects committee. And the director of, of facilities oversaw that committee. And it included um, a crew of faculty and staff, no, this staff and administrators. And that group oversaw what needed to take place regarding deferred maintenance. And um, I asked to meet with the group. And I put a huge presentation together. And again, some of the resources that I mentioned, everyone got their packet. And I'll never forget that day. It was um, in the Helen Blake um, conference room. And just explained to them how devastating it was that our field was the condition that it was. So um, they agreed to move the softball field um, as a priority on, and, and funds were, were provided. So they hired a contractor and the contractor came back and said, okay, everything that you want, 
It's going to cost about $123,000. But what was budgeted at the time, I believe, was around $75,000. So they had to make some cuts. We made some cuts. Um, and you know now we're at entering 97. And so 97, uh, everything was drafted. And they started making the renovations. Um, to what they could afford, press box, dugouts, and things like that. And by uh, the spring of 98 season, we were playing on a, on a new field. Um, so it was a long process, um, but sadly, I was counseled um, to not rough the waters until I, till tenure. And so, um, you know, the infamous, and, and that's, it's unfortunate, but that happened to be the reality. So that's my story. Great story. Um, one last question for you, Kathy. What can people do to continue to advocate on their own to help strengthen uh, Title IX? Yes. Well, I've, I've thought about this. I have a few things. Um, I understand it's easier said than done for me to turn around and say, you know, you uh, shouldn't have to wait for tenure. So my, my first piece of advice for advocacy is I, I think it's, it's very important that all voices are heard. Uh, I think we need to invite dissent. I think it's critical. Um, another co um, component or uh, advocacy component I would, would definitely say is we need to educate. We need to educate all. Um, we need to educate on the, the importance of the history uh, because history matters. I, I, I believe very few people know of, of the story of the renovations to, to, Potter, to Dr. Potterfield. Um, when I talk about educating, I think we need to educate administrators, uh, parents, school council, uh, board of trustee members. Um, and I think not only educating them, but we also have to hold them accountable. Um, I also think it's important that we vote for legislators who are going to support Title IX. Uh, I think that's critical. Um, and lastly, I think it's important for us to promote and support a healthy t Title IX culture. And how we do that is through intervention, through education, and reporting. So, um, you know, it's, we still have a long way to go. Kathy, thank you for joining us today. And thank you for all you do to uh, educate and advocate uh, for Title IX. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching and be on the lookout for Title IX events throughout campus throughout the year. Thank you.